Creó en 1976 la empresa Apple, una de las empresas más rentables del mundo. En 1997 fue nombrado miembro del Museo de la Informática. En 2001 fundó Willow Zeus, empresa dedicada a los GPS. Con ustedes, Steve Wozniak. Que suene más fuerte el aplauso para vos. ¿Cómo están? ¿Cómo están? Que los escuche vos. Es un honor tener aquí a el conocido Wizard of Wars. El día de hoy le vamos a hacer unas cuantas preguntas. Es un honor para mí estar aquí con ustedes. Mi nombre es Daniel Gómez, soy presidente de Talent Network y para nosotros es un orgullo poder tener a un hombre tan inspirador, no nada más para los mexicanos, sino para el mundo entero. So, if you want to give some fresh words to all the audience just before we start with the questions, I invite you to sit down for a... Yeah, I don't want to be out of sight of people too much. I'll stand a while. Okay. <coughs> you know... We started out <coughs> trying to create a digital industry, feeling that people who had a digital computer in their hands could solve problems that they could never solve without a computer. We wanted to make a man more than a man, a person more than a person. We wanted to give them extra abilities and make them super in ways. And we figured people would learn how to program solutions to problems. As it is, we pretty much now just use solutions that are programmed by other people. Where did we think this industry would go? Did we think it would bring us to today, where we walk around getting all the answers and all the ac action and communication and education with our iPhones? No. When we started Apple, the amount of memory that could hold a song, a nice, you like to listen to songs, that the amount of memory cost close to a million dollars. Did we envision that computers would ever play music? No. We had a couple of ideas of how people might use computers in their home. In that day, there were no computers in homes, only big, huge, multi-million dollar computers in the big companies. How would a person use a computer in the home? Well, they weren't going to do inventory. They weren't going to do sales records in their home. It had to have an element of fun. And games were a big part of my life. I wanted games to make a computer popular and usable in the home. And I thought and thought and I worked my hardest and did some genius work. And the Apple II computer, which was the foundation of Apple, it was all of Apple's profits for the first 10 years of the company. The Apple II computer was the first time ever that arcade games with moving things on a screen were in color. It was the first time ever that arcade games were software. A young kid could write a program and make things move one, two, three, four on a screen. That was a huge, huge step. Nobody had ever thought that a computer would have color and our first logo was a bunch of colors. We started with computers, but what we have today is hard to call computers. I mean, Apple still makes computers, but most of you walk around with this technology that you love and adore. Where is your computer? In the old days, I might take a computer with me and take an encyclopedia of the world on a CD-ROM, and I would insert it in my computer, and I would research Guadalajara and find out what I could find. And now, why would you ever carry that data with you? You just go on the internet and access it. So the real computers that store the data on disk drives are out in the big data centers. That's your personal computer. In a way, you pay for it. And your personal computer tells your mobile device what to do. The progression of the industry from the very start until today has always been to make the human important. The machines became more like the way humans want to deal with the world. At one point, we moved to a typewriter. 
You could type. Humans knew how to type rather than toggle switches and read lights. They could actually type into a computer at an affordable cost. And then we moved to a mouse-based screen that looked like the real world. A human being points at things. And now you could point indirectly with a mouse. Today, we're even better. You can touch with your finger like real life. Everything got more and more like real life. I remember when I got a device from Apple that I could handwrite messages, little reminders to myself. I could handwrite them and it knew what the words were. And that's living human. I'm living like a human, but the computer understands me. Today, we speak with Google Assistant, Cortana, Siri on an iPhone. We speak like we're speaking to a human friend and we get answers. So it has become more like the human gets to live the human way and the technology doesn't force us to change. And that's one thing I'm very, very glad about. Thank you very much for your answer, Was Do you want to take a seat? Like, you're um, okay? No, because some people will have trouble seeing there, me. There's big uh, TV there. I might Everyone sit. Everyone see you. Big applause for Was. I might sit. You have yes. the energy to send Oh, that. there's a big TV? Yeah, everyone could I see will. you around. I might sit because I have a um, spinal problem that causes my leg to go numb if I stand for over <laughs> we, an hour. We don't have to have any problems <laughs> Okay, here. thank you. Gracias. So, one of the questions a lot of people has uh, is how your family, your core values and friends influence you to create and be an inventor? Wow. Um, I grew up with, I look at it more like I was not influenced and said here is what you should be. Here is what you should learn. Here's something good. When I was very young, I got interested in things. I was a top math student. I would wind up getting the math awards in all my schools. Um, and mathematics, I got into electronics. My father was an electrical engineer. He did not say you should be an electrical engineer. My brother, my sister did not turn out to be engineers. I loved what he did. I loved watching him work long, long sets of equations. I didn't know how to do it, but I read a book about ham radio. In the old days, there would be a disaster in the world and only the ham radio operators, little independent people, could contact other friends through ham radio in other countries and get the word out about a horrible natural disaster, for example. And I read a book about ham radio operators where a ham radio operators, young ones, were the heroes, and they solved the kidnapping because of their knowledge, and so I ordered the instructions, and I studied electronics, and I built by hand hundreds of parts you would buy in a kit, and I would put together my transmitter and my receiver and wind strings around dials, and I, be and I became a ham radio operator when I was 10 years old, and, and I was kind of, so I was kind of proud of my electronics. I was doing something special that other people were not doing. Where did it get to digital? That was the old analog electronics days. Analog electronics with things like sine waves on wires and um, I, there were no books on computers. There were no magazines on computers. Not in the libraries near me, not in the bookstores. You couldn't find out what a computer was and accidents happen. I accidentally stumbled on some information. It taught me about the language of computers, zeros and ones, binary. And it taught me how to convert a number, a human number like 89, into a computer number, 1011111, you know, whatever it is. And I said, wow, on paper, this is fun. And it taught me how to add ones and zeros. One plus zero is one. Wow, I didn't know this. You don't need to know higher level mathematics. I was nine or 10 years old. I also got to see the evolution of transistors and the first chips that could do logic and make statements. And it be I, I made some huge projects. I look back now and I think, how could a young kid so small and tiny have built these huge projects with hundreds of parts that could play tic-tac-toe or add and subtract computer type numbers way ahead of the time, nobody around me could have, nothing in school, no parents, no relatives, no teachers, no friends did this stuff. I did it on my own because I loved it. And I said, I am going to love doing this design for the rest of my life, even though I will never have a job doing it. I was going to be two things in life, an electrical engineer 
and a teacher of elementary school kids, fifth graders, middle school kids. Uh, that was, those were my goals in life, and I was not going to be computers. There weren't jobs designing computers. When I graduated from high school, I did not think I would, there were jobs to design computers, so I would ever do that, even though I had taught myself how to design any computer in the world in two days. Believe me, you don't, it takes a lot, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, trying over and over and over to getting really good at it. And I got really good at it, but I didn't think there were jobs. Computers were designed in places with weird names like research. What the heck is that? So, um, so anyway, but I had, but I, I, everything that I built for fun, I would show to friends, look what I created. It's something amazing, something you wouldn't have imagined. It didn't have to be worth any money for me even up to their Apple computers. I've developed them for fun, to have neat products to show off. I wanted respect from engineers. I knew that I was very bright. I had methods of designing things for about 10 years that were like magic, and I wanted other engineers to look at my design and say, wow, that was some good engineering. You used so few parts. You wrote your code in such a clever, little, compact way. I wanted that respect more than I wanted, you know, oh, he's, he created a personal computer. Oh, he started an industry. Oh, he started a company. No, I don't, um, those weren't important to me. I just wanted to do the best work I could and share it with others. That's why one of my first computers, not the first computer I ever built in my life, but one that would eventually become the Apple I computer. I built it. Steve Jobs wasn't around yet. He was in another, another state. He didn't know it existed. I would take it down to my club a club of people like you, young people who like the new interesting technical things. I would take it to the club and I gave away my designs for free. No copyright notice, no nothing. Here it is, you can build it for $300. You can build a computer with 4K of RAM that will do a useful job. I had told my father when I was in high school, someday I'm gonna own a 4K computer. 4K was enough to type a program in. My father said, well, it costs as much as a house. And I said, okay, I'll live in an apartment. I was going to have that computer. And once I had it, I gave away to other people how to build it. And um, that's just because, I mean, that was where I was motivated from. There was also no sign yet that this industry was going to be worth a lot of money. All the big companies, Hewlett Packard, IBM, Digital Equipment Corporation, they were all putting us down and saying, this li these little computers are going to be unimportant and they aren't going to be worth a lot of money. And that just gave Steve Jobs and I the break to be two young people with a neat little product to have a way to not have all the big companies taking the market away before we got in. Thank you very much for your answer again. You're welcome. You're welcome. Big applause again for us. There's... You know... There is a lot of information at the internet, uh, a lot of fake news. Uh, there is even a movie about the Apple story. I would like to know the real story of Apple. There have been a few movies. I like entertainment, and to me the most entertaining movie was Pirates of Silicon Valley. <laughs> and every, funny, but every scene in that movie, you can't make up the personalities correctly of lesser known people. Other people in the Apple company, for example, or, or in Microsoft, that aren't well publicized. You don't know how to portray them. So every scene was portrayed differently than it really happened. But every scene in the movie actually happened with the meaning of that movie. And here we were in a battle to change history, to fight, and Microsoft just wants to sit down and take control. And there's a lot you can learn from that movie. Now, the movie with Ashton Kushner, I don't like the movie at all because it covers the early years of Apple that were never well recorded and it gets a lot of things wrong when they go back and they want to portray especially Steve Jobs the way they want to see him because he's such a hero in our lives now. They want to make him as sort of the guide and, and the founding of the company and it leaves out an awful lot of detail. It shows me in a basement working as an engineer and Steve Jobs comes in and says, I'm dragging you to a computer club to show off your computer. What the heck? He'd never gone to the club. He lived in Oregon on a commune. I went to the club every two weeks and showed off my computer. I helped other people build it. I said, Steve, let me go show you what's happening. 
they get these things backwards, they twist it backwards in time, because I never cared when we started the company, I never wanted any publicity, I never wanted to put myself out there, I never wanted to see the press, Steve wanted to be face of the company. So they get those things wrong, and that bothers me a lot. Um, they, they had Steve in a car for Bob Dylan, like I'm for the Beatles. Wait a minute, the first day I met Steve Jobs, he was in high school, he didn't have any record albums, I brought him to my house and I showed him the Bob Dylan albums. I had them all. And I showed him the liner notes with Bob Dylan saying strange things. I showed him the lyrics to songs like Desolation Row. Whoa, and it became a big part of our lives. We were young friends for the next five years before starting Apple. We were close friends, going to concerts together, chasing music, playing pranks and jokes. Um, quite a, quite a, it was a different Steve Jobs until we started the company with real big money. Um, so, I don't know. Anyway, that's enough for now. Thank you very much for your answer. Yeah. <laughs> you, you... Oh, the third movie. The third, the recent movie with Michael Fassbender was actually an excellent movie with excellent acting and production, but it wasn't about the Apple story. People are really interested in the Apple story and what happened, you know, stage by stage. That movie was only about Steve Jobs' personality. And the incidences in the movie never happened. I mean, I went to the events that were shown in the movie, but I never talked to Steve Jobs at those events. I never said things ever negative to them. I have this principle in life that if people are bad to you, you're still good to them, and that I will never say anything bad to anyone, I, you know, any friend. And so, um, I never, so they had me in the movie in over 14 years saying something that related, related to one experience I had with one phone call, not to Steve Jobs, but to John Scully, our CEO. So that movie, that movie though, represented what was Steve's personality like among people? How did his brilliance come out with a little bit of like, not caring, you know, what other people felt about it? And I thought that was very accurate. Okay, so the next question is, you were a teacher for years. You, you really are into education. You teach a lot of things to students, but if you could teach something to all our audience, all these Mexicans with all this energy, what will you deliver them as knowledge today? If I could teach, first of all, I would point out that your personality tends to become permanent between the ages of 18 and 23. And after that point in time, you are who you are. You might be an inventor who wants to go invent new things and be creative and do innovative things. Or you might just be a well-studied engineer who knows the formulas and how to, how to follow through on jobs, but your personality isn't going to change too much after that. So while you're young and you still have a chance, tell yourself, have conversations with yourself inside. This is what I did. Tell yourself who you want to be and how you want to be for life and say, this will be permanent. Even if I have a huge success like Apple, computer, and all the wealth more than you could ever imagine, that you won't let it change who you are and your values and what you believe in. And I did that very successfully. Like I said, I had wanted, when I was young, I had wanted to be an engineer and a middle, middle school teacher. So I went back and I taught fifth graders through ninth graders for eight years of my life in the public schools where I live. I did it secretly with no press. I got up to teaching seven days a week. And not only that, always put creativity first. I had done so many things that were not in any engineering books that were crazy. I mean, color to an American television when we started Apple cost $5,000 to do, and I figured out a way to do it for zero dollars. Just put a number into a television and it would think it was color. I mean, it was strange thinking that I had for so long, and um, I always wanted to be creative and do things that weren't, never copy other people's work. Don't look at a piece of paper, here's a design, now go build it your way. No, you've got to have cleverness and ideas. You've got to force yourself to try to think of things other people wouldn't think of. And uh, so that was, that was also a big part of, uh, that's a big part of what I would teach everyone. Try to be creative. Now the greatest creativity of all is humor. Enjoy what you're doing. Don't, do, don't say, here's a plan. My plan is, I am going to start a company, I'm going to write a business plan, I'm going to raise money. Wait a minute, I'm going to build something interesting should be your idea, not a, not a strict structured plan. Follow your heart, do things you like to do that aren't worth money, improve your skills, and if your skills are good enough, you will have a chance to have a big home run. Thank you very much for the answer.
Actually, I, I will be very but honest. I would also add, always keep the passion in your heart yeah. and listen to a lot of music. I think about the ways I live my life and very often I go back to words that were in songs and think this is something I heard and it must have, it must have inspired me. Actually, you are one of the humblest persons I ever met in my life. And I always tell people, like, I wear red shoes because you always, always you see some red shoes, you remember where you have to have your foot at. So that, that's the knowledge we need to share to all these young people. And talking about this, yeah, I'm I not think... Just, I'm not humble. I just want to be friends with everyone. Who, why do you want to go through life and have people dislike you? Because you kind of attacked them and said they were bad. And, and so I'm very non-critical, very pacifist also. Came from a lot of Vietnam days. That's great. So coming to more questions, there's people that say that you don't trust money. What about this? What about the future of Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, all these new coins, the, the uh, future? What do you well, think about that? Bitcoin is a small element sort of compared to the hugeness of what blockchain technology can lead, to, lead us to. But Bitcoin, I loved Bitcoin when I heard about it because the total amount of Bitcoin is determined by mathematics. Mathematics comes from nature. It is far superior to anything that human beings can create on their own. Money created by human beings, a symbol, and money can change. The government can print more money and say, okay, now all the money you have is sort of worth a little bit less, a little bit less. There's too many factors that are controlled by humans, and the humans in control can factor it. They cannot factor how many Bitcoin there are. I'm just hoping that we keep the freedom of things like Bitcoin and other blockchain technology. We keep the freedom for ourselves, and it isn't taken away by government because I'm a, I fear that it will be. Okay, so now you mentioned the word government. And I would like to know what's your perspective with, between the Mexicans and today's relationship between Mexico and Mr. Trump. So what do you think about that? I have been in Mexico and other parts of Latin America quite a bit. And I meet the most passionate people in the world. People that care about things and are excited about the future. I studied Spanish 25, 27 years ago, but I don't use it enough, so I'm not speaking Spanish here. But I lived in Cuernavaca for four months studying Spanish, and I've always had a closest. I've watched Mexico over 30 years or more rise economically and come up to be a very different place than it used to be, and I admire Mexico. So all this talk about walls to me is artificial. That, so what? We, we, I was brought up with core values. My father talked to me a lot about our constitution, our country, what it meant. And as Americans, we were all brought up to think of ourselves as a land of immigrants. We're all taught that. And I was so proud of my country, that my country took in poor people from around the world and let them come and have a better life and things. And now I just see the opposite happening. So, so I, that doesn't appeal to me. Um, as far as Mex Mexico and the United States should always be working together. I believe we should be. And, and trade barriers. Why does a country come up and say, we're going to have trade barriers? Certain goods that come in from Mexico to the United States, we're going to put a tariff on it. We're going to charge taxes. Wait a minute. That's almost like saying that the consumers in America cannot buy the best product at the best price. They're forced to buy a higher priced product that's worse because it's American. Wait a minute, that's like you're taxing, you're putting the penalty on. The American citizens, the buyers, the consumers are paying and you're paying it to people that run American companies, big wealthy company owners. And I just don't think that's right and that's not, that's not freedom, that's not free trade. Thank you very much for your answer and thanks for being in Mexico to demonstrate that in a practical way. How, how's the Wozniak post Apple. What are you working for the next two years? Post Apple. What am I working on? Well, one of the, with recently with Raspberry Pi computers and Arduinos and Chip, the little nine dollar CHIP computer. I started saying I'm going to learn this Linux world. 
and I'm going to learn how to program in it and all this. And I set about doing a bunch of projects, working late at night, following instructions, steps not working, going and researching, trying to find better Linux shell commands. And I worked and worked, and oh, I was so frustrated. And then I solved one thing after another. And I got, I got several of my projects working, and I was so happy, and I realized this is what makes me happy in life. This is what drives me. Working on things that you have to solve to get working and you don't know how to do it in huge numbers of hours, it doesn't come easy. And that's what I love. And I had been distracted from that for 30 years. Because of Apple's success, I always bought the Apple products. I signed up for all the carriers I could. I tested them. I compared features. I bought competitors' products. I just love technology. I love seeing what's new. And for 30 years, I was using other people's products. And then I found out that, oh, to use a smartphone, you know, my grandmother can use a smartphone faster than me for what she needs. So you never kind of win there. And I want to go back and just be a little developer again. You know, it's like the idea of a hackathon. I think that that's where Apple came from. That's where the future is going to come from. What am I working on? Yes, I'm, I do a lot of traveling and speaking because I want to inspire people that are high school age and college age and shortly after that, university age, um, because I want to inspire them to realize we started Apple with two young people in our young 20s with no money, no bank accounts, and no rich relatives, and no business experience at all. So basically, you can be humble and poor and small. You just call the garage humbleness, and you can still start at home and, and, uh, and be successful. So I try to inspire people with stories, and I try to make people laugh wherever I can. I also um, I put on a, a, a um, popular culture event called Silicon Valley Comic Con. And I put that one on, and we've had two successful years. And um, it just appeals to the sort of people that are into technology, these Comic Con shows. A um, long time ago, I put on some huge music festivals in California. A million tickets sold in each of the years, 82 and 83. Huge festivals that didn't exist back then. And of course, now we have Bonnaroo and Coachella and so many of these other huge festivals, but that was really the seed for it. Um, I'm also with a technology company that makes storage work more efficiently in the data centers where all your work's being done. And that's, a, that's a, with a technology company. And I've got more things in the works. Thank you very much for the answer. So, uh, talking about the future, someone asked me a very interesting question, actually. Would you be willing to go on one of the Elon Musk trips to Mars? Would I be willing to go on one of the Elon Musk trips to Mars? Any one-way trip to Mars, I would happily go on. I'm a little bit too old. It doesn't make that much sense when you're old and maybe you're even close to death. Who knows? So I, so I don't, but I would, I would definitely any time in my life would want to sign up for the one-way trip to Mars. I have signed up for a couple of them online. You know, they're not going to happen probably, but um, I don't know. It's just, I'm just so thrilled. It's like exploring and creating something and discovering something that never was possible before is a driving force in probably most of the people here, probably most of our lives and heads. So I would love to be a part of that. Thank you very much. So one last question before we open. We will open for the last 15 minutes the questions to the audience. I think people should know who the real was and one of your passions, we were talking about, about it, is dogs. So why don't you tell them some stories about your dogs, which makes you more like that human connection to people? Yes. Well, I am very lucky in life. The luckiest thing of all is my family. I met a woman who had, was at Apple in education, who was kind of a geek, and, you know, not one of those fancy movie star type people, but the way she talked, oh my gosh, I was so impressed. I couldn't approach her for years. And finally we got together and we're married. The two of us are like one. We discuss, when you have a marriage, you just don't know what, how to have a good one. You discuss everything together. We have similar values on books and movies and songs and this and that, not always identical, but um, liking the same things, and we just live a life together. But we have two dogs. I have owned dogs for 35 years. Janet never had dogs before she met me. And, and these two dogs are so much a part of my life. Whenever I see a dog, I think there is a brain in there. It has feelings. I care so much. I cry at movies very easily. 
Feelings are in me. Emotions are in me. I go down and I start talking to the dogs face to face about how their mother was to them and how they are and how they look and are they happy. And I try to scratch them and carry them in my arms. And they're like little young infants to me. I worry when I travel like today, I worry my dogs, I've been gone for a week. Are they going to think that daddy's just a temporary daddy? I worry so much about that. And so, and dogs have been a big part of my life and, um, and I just do anything to make them feel happy. I'll carry my dog in my arms long distances and we'll go to many walks a day. Whenever I'm home, nowadays I'm only home half the days. And when I'm home, it's so few of the time, I'm usually not available for other things than very local things or my family, my, my wife, my dogs. Thank you very much for your answer. So we are ready to open the questions to the audience. Oh, oh you have a question? My third, my third dog. Yeah, oh, we yeah, might yeah. arrange something. Yeah, yeah. I flew into Guadalajara a couple nights ago, and there was a dog without a collar, an unattached dog, a stray dog. And I got down on my knees, and I started talking to this dog. And he looked at me with his eyes, and he, and he kissed me on, the, on the, my lips. This, and this dog, I scratched him. I found his good tickle spots. He wanted food. I didn't have any. He tried to follow me into the car, and I had to tell him, I would take you. I want to adopt that dog. So I'm going to still go back and try to find that dog if I'm lucky today. And, and uh, I'll make sure he gets some the help. Mexican dog. You already have a someday, name for the someday, dog. Someday, yeah. You my, already... wife will, my wife might kill me. but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are ready to open the questions to the audience. If you have a question, you raise your hand. Uh, there's uh, some microphones, I think so, around. Uh, just if you have the question in Spanish, I will translate it. Uh, and please be very fast. We just have 13 minutes. So where's the mic? Yeah. So whatever is the mic, start talking. Microfono. Oh, there, there is the mic. You point, you choose. Okay. This guy. Hey, Steve, how are you? My name is Ivan Lozano. Actually, well, I'm an electronic engineer working in Silicon Valley. I live in Silicon Valley. And number you know one, what, Yuan, like, I'm one of the founders of the Silicon Valley Carnegie yeah, Mellon. Man, that's I went and my son, my you. son went to Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Awesome, awesome. So now I'm working in a drone company. I'm developing drones with artificial intelligence, and it's amazing. I'm there because you. So thank you, number number one. So question number one: What do I need to do to be your friend? I really admire you. I get inspired by, for you several times. So I would like to be around you and learn uh, how to improve myself to keep improving the world. What do I need to do? To be your friend. You have to think that out for yourself. To yeah. be my friend, I don't have time because there's a million people that want to be my friends and there's only <laughs> one of me. I understand. But, well, so, I like to go out and meet friendly people. I can't meet everyone in the world, but I go out when I travel. I, I have groups that I meet of friends almost everywhere I go. And at home, I set up dinners and all that. So you can contact me via old school email. <laughs> okay, so, next number, I, I have another one. What do you one think question about? only, okay. because we have a lot of people okay. want... Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, Ultra. Um, you, you choose... The girl, maybe? Okay. Uh, here? Hello there. Hello. Hi, I'm wondering what are some of the things that we can do in our daily lives to cultivate innovation? So what can we do every day? Think about your reasons for doing things. Are you trying to do some good for the world? Are you trying to help other people that need help? That should be your first motivation. And then you should also, in your innovation, your projects, let's say that you can write programs or build things, do a lot of them for fun that are just fancy games or tricks that you can show your friends and develop the skills. If you do that long and long, you'll get so good at it, any idea you think of, you'll be sure you can get to a solution. And when you hit, that doesn't guarantee you're going to be super successful. Even if you do everything right, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have a successful company in most people's terms. So define sex as, define, define success as your own happiness. Yes, that has to be number one, because you can do everything right and not succeed, or you can just be lucky and the first time you try something, have a huge success. There's no formula. A lot of people might like to get up here and say, here is how you do it. I've done it a lot of times. 
I don't like structure anymore. I just like being yourself and thinking yourself out and try to make things as natural for human beings as possible. And then is it possible to get a selfie later? Okay. <laughs> selfie? Hi, uh, I'm Gina Weber. I work for Hewlett Packard Enterprise and I know you have a past related to HP. Um, so my question for you is, did you, did you uh, apply any best practices that you had in the past for, from HP to Apple and, uh, and what would they be that you would consider keeping? Okay. While I was doing a lot of projects in my life for Atari, for p other people, I built the first hotel movie system in the world. I was doing all these projects. I would usually do them for free or five cents. I worked at Hewlett Packard. The Hewlett Packard values, the morale was so incredible. I worked building the hottest, most important product of the times. The handheld scientific calculators from the earliest one on. And I worked there, and we were building important projects to the world. I didn't even have a college degree, but I was well respected as a design engineer at Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard had philosophies of putting the maximum decision making at the lowest levels of management possible. Nowadays, most large corporations, any decision that gets made has to go all the way up to the top, and it's very cumbersome. Let a low level employee say, hey, this is the right thing to do, we'll do it. Don't, risk, don't have so much of the, the bureaucracy. Hewlett Packard had very good ways to get people in our division, on our floor of the building, to meet each other. A lot of ways, not just beer bus, but you know, twice a day they would roll in coffee and pastries and we would talk and meet with each other. And I loved that company. The company cared about its employees so much. Here's what happened, in 1973, there was a large recession. So all the companies were laying off 10% of the people, putting them on the street with no job. Maybe the youngest ones, maybe the newest ones. Hewlett Packard decided they would cut everyone's salary by 10% instead and give you one day off every two weeks. One out of every 10 days off, that's great for a young kid out of college, you know? And I, I really admired that to say we aren't gonna put some people totally out of work and other things. I never got a lot of the values. Here's one of the values at HP. They had a policy. I wanted to build projects, but I needed parts. I needed chips. They had a policy that you could have parts out of the storeroom, which was always unlocked. I could go back at night and get parts out of the storeroom for any project of your own design, as long as your first level supervisor approved. So I was able to build projects, including the Apple computers, because of that openness. And it goes back to David Packard, I think, visiting an engineer working at night who needed a part to replace and couldn't get it. And David Packard himself, of Hewlett Packard, took an ax and axed into the storeroom to get the part. And from then on, they had a policy that no storerooms would be locked. And when we started Apple, I didn't run the business. I was the designer, the inventor, the engineer but our storerooms were locked up and we never got to the values that I felt so strongly about morally. Hi, Steve. Uh, I want to start a, a little, empresa, uh, puedo decir? Sorry about the English. I, Puedes I decir en español y yo te le traduzco. Ah, ok. Quiero empezar una pequeña empresa, pero... Cuando yo intento platicarles mi proyecto a mi familia, a mis amigos, ellos me dicen que estoy loco, que nunca voy a ser nadie, pero el lugar de donde yo vengo, las personas son muy aburridas, muy apáticas, ellos solo quieren trabajar para el gobierno, solo quieren ser maestros para la escuela o algo parecido, pero yo quiero más, entonces yo quiero un advice, uh, no sé cómo se dice en español. Eh, yeah. <laughs> One thing is, of course, you're thinking the same way I thought and Steve Jobs thought when we started Apple. And we had a lot of people saying, oh, just you don't start your own company, you go to work for larger companies like Hewlett Packard. Um, you can tell them that. You can put that in Spanish. Yeah, he understands English. Oh, you understand English. Oh, great. Okay, so one thing I noticed. 
I didn't think about it before we started Apple. Oh, here is what you need to do. I mean, I was following my passion and my heart. It didn't have to be worth money. It wa I never, ever did it for money. Um, when you, <clears throat> I look back after the fact and I say, why, what were some of the elements that made companies like Apple and other little startups, Facebook and Google and one year the stories, what made them successful? And I look back and I say, well, at Apple, we had strong engineering. We had a working prototype of the product that would be our company for the next 10 years. We had it before we raised money. And Steve and I had no money. We had to raise money. We knew it was such a great product. But you need a business element. Steve Jobs wanted a business. He wanted to be successful in life. He wanted to make things that would reach a lot of people. And to do that, to, to do the, take the important steps, you had to have a company and you had to have money. So he took the business steps. Our investor owned as much of the company as Steve and I own. He joined us. He said, we will be a market-driven company. Marketing, people who think out, what are the right products to build? What are the wrong products to build? What is good? What is bad? What should the price be? Marketing. Those three elements, business, marketing, engineering. You should always plan on having all of those three as part of your starting team. <coughs> a lot of business students say, hey, I will write a business plan, I'll do some spreadsheets, and I will come up with a formula, and I'll raise money, and then I'll hire some engineers to build my idea. I'm sorry, those ideas are everywhere in the world. You know, they're in Spain, they're in Portugal, they're in France, they're in Brazil, they're here. Ideas are easy, actually doing the work to build something. Make at least a working virtual presentation on a screen so other people can see how your ideas will work and you'll be worth a lot more money. But don't say I'm gonna hire the engineers later. I was always gonna be an engineer in my life and I believe that engineering is a type of honesty. You have to make something that works or it doesn't work. It's like solving mathematical formulas. You get the answer or you don't. It's very strict in that way. Engineers become so clever at solving problems. Look at a hackathon, look at the hacking community and, and in general. How do I get around something that nobody has a solution yet? And that cleverness is what you need in defining what your product will be. But try to find some friends that believe in it with you early on. Might only be one or two from the way you're talking, but that's all it takes. Thank you very much. One last question. Uh, where's the mic? There is your mic. You want this side, that side, you choose. Hello, Steve. I want to make you a question. Do you think that one day the computers can reach the human creativity? And, well, that's a fact. It's very close that moment, but you don't think that that will make us lost a little part of our humanity? Because if a machine, if a computer can do the same thing as me or everybody, an artist, a, a musician, you don't think that that makes us lost a little part of our humanity? Of course. I fear all the time that we are losing our humanity. And to me, the human has to be worth more than the technology. And that's sort of turning around on us. So how does it work out in the end? Do we lose a battle? In the early days, 200 years ago, in Manchester, in Manchester, England, they learned how to install modern manufacturing techniques to make inexpensive clothing. From then on, we would fire humans, but we would never fire the machines that made our clothing. And over in time, manual labor jobs, like somebody working in a car factory, bolting the same bolt all day long, every day, every week, every month, those jobs got taken over by little electronic motorized robots that could do the job better, more reliably, with fewer mistakes. So those jobs went away. But new jobs always, new types of opportunities always pop up. Now we're unfortunately talking about, we've got Siri or Google Assistant. And you can talk to it, you can answer, ask questions, and you'll get better answers than from a human. Is it replacing the brain? Okay, the brain used to memorize a lot of things, but now you've got Google and it does a better job. The brain used to do calculations, but now you can just ask Siri what a calculation is and get a quicker answer. Is it worth using our brains in ways that they've even been used in the past? The scariness is 
look at the financial trades of the world, the big investment trade houses, 80% of their trades are now done computer to computer, country to country, in milliseconds, thousandths of a second. Because if you put a slow human in the way to make decisions, you lose money. What if it got to the point that having a human CEO in a company loses money compared to a new company that doesn't even have a human CEO, just computers making rapid decisions? So that is, a, that is a valid fear. One thing good, though, to think about is that has the brain ever really been equaled? Well, we have machines that learn like a human learns, learn to play a game in one hour and it beats any human. Learn to play a game like Go and you can beat the best Go player in the world. It's learning, that's sort of a brain. No, it's only a part of the brain. Does a computer ever say, what should I do today? What is a good task to, to do? What is something that needs to be solved? Does a computer say, hmm, here's a method I might give myself that'll let me learn how to, how to solve this problem? No, all those higher level steps still come from humans. And the world that I see in the future, decades from now, maybe hundreds of years from now, is that computers and humans are just a partnership, just like myself and my wife. And we should make sure that we are always good friend on friendly terms with the computers, the smarter they get, the robots, the smarter they get. We should keep the friendship there. And Isaac Asimov had the rule of robotics. A robot cannot harm a human being. It was deeply embedded, so the, the, the robots couldn't have free thought about that. I have Waz's law. No human can harm a thinking, feeling robot. So, and then we should let the robots never fear that we are a threat to their mortality. Because then they could grow up being enemies saying, we have to, these humans are bad for us. No, we should always be their best friends. I think that we bet all the technology that we create is to make life easier for us, to help us, so we don't have to do anything. Someday we may not have to do anything, and we'll have our housing, and our food, and our transportation, entertainment, education, vacations, everything in life we'll just have because the, the computers now create it all without us having to lift a finger. And that's like we would be the family dog. I don't have to do anything, I just get my good happy life for free. And ever since I got that idea, I started feeding my dogs filet steaks. Steaks and good chicken, human food, because if I'm gonna be a pet someday, I'm gonna do unto others the way I want it done unto me. I'm gonna be as good, <laughs> good to my own pets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just before, just before we close, I want to invite Raul, head of Campus Party, to join us to the stage. Uh, and I was thinking on, what could we give you as a gift? And we are very patriotic in Me Mexico. We are very thankful you are here. Give and me a red iPhone. Give me a red iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> what we will do is like, Woz will say Viva Mexico, and then people in the audience will say Viva again. And you will say it three times. The first time you will feel the power, the second time you will feel the love, and the third time you will feel the future. So you will get back with a lot of energy. So you have to tell everyone, Viva Mexico, and they will answer Viva, okay? Yes. So, first time. You give all the energy to us. Viva al Mexico. Viva. Ah. Viva al Mexico. Viva. Viva al Mexico. Viva. Thank you very much, Was. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias por habernos acompañado. Muchísimas gracias, Gobierno de Jalisco, Universidad de Guadalajara, una, Gobierno de Guadalajara, Zapopan, todas las instituciones, INJUVE, todos los patrocinadores. Muchísimas gracias. Nos vemos el año que viene. Cuídense mucho, cultiven su talento y vuelvan a ganar aquí el año que viene. Muchas gracias a todos.